Uh, yeah. I'm always ready when it's game time. Hustle in my blood, I'ma make mine. Where I'm trying to go, it's gonna take time. You can earn your respect, I'ma take mine. In a lane of my own, I'm in a zone. Hello and welcome to this edition of Going the Distance where we talk faith, sports, and everything in between. You know, most kids dream of playing for their favorite sports teams. And some, a small few, actually make it. New York Mets pitcher Steven Matz is one of them. But achieving his dream didn't come without its setbacks. After an arm injury put him on the bench for two years, he began questioning his purpose. And it wasn't until he reconnected with his faith that things began to snap back into place. Take a look. It's this one to center field. Hamilton going back. It's turned around and it's over his head. Two runs will score. Steven Matz with a double drives home a pair. New York Mets pitcher Steven Matz is living his childhood dream. First, he's playing Major League Baseball. Secondly, his family has been Mets fans as long as he can remember. It's really cool. Um, you know, now that I'm kind of here, you're kind of entrenched in what you're doing, so you're, the fan side of it's out. But for my family, it's huge. Um, you know, just being a local guy, they get to read the papers, they read about me in the papers, and that's something that's really cool for them. Stephen grew up in a Christian home and confessed his faith in Christ as a boy. And he says making it to the majors is an answer to prayer. Strike three. I remember when I was growing up, I prayed for like three things every day. And it was, please let no bad guys come into my house. It was please let me date this girl. It was actually four things. Please let me become a major league baseball player and please let me get this dog I wanted. And now everything came true, so oh, wow. <laughs> it's kind of funny. But as he got older, he was more interested in playing baseball than getting to know God. It wasn't a relationship. It was more of like, you know, it was something that I couldn't get in contact with. It was, okay, you be a good person or, or whatever it is and you'll be fine. Meanwhile, Stephen was drafted in 2009 out of high school and put in the instructional league the stage before the minors. But before he got a chance to pitch in his first professional game, he tore a tendon in his arm during practice and underwent surgery. Stephen was unable to pitch for two years. He began to question if he still had the ability to achieve his dream. And, you know, with all those expectations and stuff, there's just so much doubt that creeps in your head. And, um, you know, can I get healthy? Can, when I get healthy, can I get the guys out, that, you know, professional hitters out? So there's just a lot that was, that was going on at the time. Steven was at an all-time low and didn't know how to pull himself up. But an invitation he received changed his perspective. And uh, someone invited me to a Bible study, and, and that Bible study, I'd heard really the gospel for the first time, just plain and simple. With a better understanding of the gospel, Stephen began building his relationship with the Lord. And he says this was God's plan all along. It, it took me two years to come back. That second year was the year I was able to do Bible study. So, you know, he, he used that time and you know he prepared my heart for that time to attend that Bible study and she uh, showed me a great church to go to that that same Bible study teacher so it was awesome. With a new relationship with Christ Stephen says his goals had changed. And I just remember my mindset it's just completely different you know when you uh, the, I'm, my identity is not in baseball anymore where back then my identity was baseball well, my identity is in Jesus now and understanding what that's all about just using this as a platform. Steven threw his first pitch as a pro in 2012. Three seasons later, he was finally called up to join the New York Mets in June 2015, where he helped them become National League champions and make it to the 2015 World Series. You know, it was cool to get called up and be able to pitch at home. You know, I believe that God didn't take me through all that to end it right there. And, you know, it brought me back and I was able to pitch in the World Series that year. And, now Steven is a major league veteran who understands that even in a game where you can fail more than you succeed, what's important to remember is that through all the physical and mental stress of baseball, identity and strength can be found through a relationship with Jesus Christ. When people see Steve Matz on the mound, what is it that you want them to see? I just want them to see a, you know, a fierce competitor. I want them to, to know I'm a Christian by, by the works that I do off the field and not by so much on how I speak or, or whatever, but just by the way I act. Well, I've heard it said that a setback is a set up for a comeback. Isn't it amazing how God does that? Sometimes he hits the pause button for us so that we can pull things back into perspective. Well, coming up, meet a guy in the Baltimore Ravens organization that doesn't walk or speak, but can still motivate a crowd after this.
But welcome back. Many say he's the most influential member of the Baltimore Ravens organization. O.J. Brigance was diagnosed with ALS just after retiring from the NFL. Since then, he has defied the odds. Take a look. This is O.J. Brigance. He can't walk, talk, or breathe on his own. And yet, as the Baltimore Ravens senior advisor to player development, he is one of the most influential people in the Ravens organization. In 2007, O.J. was diagnosed with ALS, commonly known as Lou Gehrig's disease. It destroys the neurons in the brain that control motor function. But that never stopped O.J. Before ALS, O.J. was a warrior on the gridiron for 13 years. By communicating through his computer, he spoke about his fascination with the game. I learned to love the game of football at tender age. I used to watch it obsessively and was thrilled when I got the chance to play in Little League. The sport gave me greater confidence and discipline. Besides that, with a name like O.J. at the pinnacle of the other O.J.'s success, it was probably fate that I would play the game. O.J.'s parents raised him with strong Christian values, but he didn't fully accept Christ for himself until his second year at Rice University. A church mother at Brentwood Baptist Church cornered me one day after services. She was known for winning souls for Christ, but she asked me to commit my life to Christ, and I did so that day. After spending four years at Rice, OJ's dream of playing pro football was shattered. You're watching the NFL draft. Your name's not called. What are your thoughts? I was disappointed when I didn't get drafted. Deep down in my spirit, I knew that I could play professionally. I just needed the opportunity. Even though the NFL showed no interest, the Canadian Football League did. OJ would spend the next five years in the CFL making a name for himself. He even helped the Baltimore Stallions win a championship, the Grey Cup. Then NFL scouts started to take notice, but still no offers. Then Shanda suggested he call the teams himself. What prompted you? to tell him that. The Holy Spirit did. I mean, th that's the only place it could have come from because when I begin to understand that this is what he needed to do to share this with him and tell him and encourage him to go ahead, this was his time. Well, she was right. OJ started calling teams and finally signed with the Miami Dolphins. After four seasons, OJ landed with the Baltimore Ravens where he helped the team win Super Bowl 35, a feat that made him the only player to win a Super Bowl and a Grey Cup for the same city. After a stint with the St. Louis Rams and the New England Patriots, OJ retired from football in 2002. Five years later, he received news that he had ALS. Were you angry? How, how did you feel? I wasn't angry because I didn't fully grasp the weight of everything. When I did realize there was no cure, I broke down and cried. After I dried my tears, I received the revelation that God was still here and had us in His hands. What has your faith in the Lord meant to you throughout this journey? Our faith in Jesus Christ has allowed us to achieve a higher perspective of our earthly circumstances. Proverbs 24.10 says, if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. To stand in the midst of this adversity, we have been in training under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Life has prepared us for this moment, and if it weren't so, God would have never allowed it to happen. OJ is still a warrior with the heart of a lion. Even though he can't talk, he still has a voice through speeches, working with his foundation, the Brigance Brigade, and writing. He even authored a book entitled, Strength of a Champion. So as long as his heart beats, OJ will continue to inspire his team and everyone around him. He says that I'm strength for him, he's strength for me, because I, I still depend on him. You know, I still need him. Um, He's taught me so much. You know, we have really have connected 
spiritually, emotionally, you know, and that is what keeps us strong. Hello, my queen. This is a voyage of three, not just two. And as long as we have God in the center, everything around it will come together. People with ALS are usually given three to five years to live. OJ is in year 12, and the battle continues. God has only given us a finite amount of time to complete our assignment, and there will always be stumbling blocks. The key is to recognize those stumbling blocks as opportunities for growth and advancement, not as a deterrence or hindrance. I pray my legacy as I trusted God and made the most of what He entrusted to me while I had it. I hope my life has been a testimonial that with God all things are possible. There is still more to be done in me, but I thank Jesus I am still in the process. That was perhaps one of the most profound interviews I have ever had the privilege to do. I mean, OJ is amazing, and you can see why he's so influential. He hasn't allowed ALS to restrict his impact on the world. I mean, I'm looking at him and then looking at myself like, Sean, you need to do more. <laughs> and what's even more incredible is that it starts at home. His wife Shanda said it all when she said that she still needs and depends on him. I mean, wow, incredible. Well, coming up, he was a man driven by anger since the age of seven. Now he's driven by love after this. But welcome back. NFL safety Shamarco Thomas is arguably one of the hardest working players in the league. I'm sure you're familiar with the term gym rat. Well, there's gym rats and then there's Shamarco Thomas. And many ask why he works so hard. Well, his answer is a simple one derived from a troubled childhood that was fueled with anger. NFL safety Shamarco Thomas has built a reputation for himself as an aggressive, hard-hitting player with a work ethic that many would argue is second to none. His go-out-and-get-after-it attitude is one that he acquired growing up in Virginia Beach, Virginia with his mom and five siblings. Describe what your mom was like. How do you remember your mother? She was the ultimate leader. She was my father and my mom. Uh, my mom was different. She wasn't the mom that, oh, I love you type. She was that tough mom, oh, boy, you better get up, no crying type stuff. Shamarco's mother, Ebeth, gave birth to him when she was 15. He didn't really know his father. Growing up, he saw things no child should have to witness. My mom had boyfriends that I remember we used to hide out from them, stuff like that, you know. I see my mom get burnt by iron by a dude. Shamarco didn't trust men around his mother, so when she married Abdul Rahim Shabazz, he didn't like him. But over time, they slowly began to bond. I think football brought us together, you know, and just seeing the way he treated my mom, taking her out on dates and stuff like that. I'd never seen that before with another man. The family grew with the addition of his sister and four brothers. For him, life couldn't be better until his father violated his mother's trust. I mean, he broke her heart, you know, cheated on my mom and... Did they separate? Separate, my dad separated, yeah. He moved with the lady. The first man Shamarco had ever trusted left his mother with six children to raise by herself. And he was furious. And my mom working at McDonald's and stuff, you know, so I think that all the anger inside of me just built up and I just started hanging around the wrong crowd and doing the wrong things. Honestly, I was telling my mom, oh, I'm gonna sell drugs, I'm gonna do stuff like that. As he entered Ocean Lakes High School as a freshman football player, his mother was too busy with work to help keep him out of trouble. So he always seemed to find it. So I was out there just trying to have fun and, enjoy, and chill with my friends and fight. And fight? You just wanted to fight? Fight, man. I used to fight all the time, every day. Why? Just to get my anger out, you know? His activities grabbed the attention of school faculty members Jim Prince and Chris Scott, Shamarco's football coaches, as well as Leslie Riccio, his guidance counselor, and Sergeant Adam Bernstein, the school's resource officer. And they all intervened to help him deal with his anger and the reasons behind it. Instantly, I was drawn to him, and I thought, this kid is going to be my project for this year. Um, you know, I want to, to make him feel comfortable and, and kind of reward him for feeling comfortable with me without even knowing me. He would never let you in, but when he knew that you cared, then that's where things started to reveal themselves. During that year, Shamarco had a few encounters with Sergeant Adam Bernstein. But one day after school, he caught Shamarco in a street brawl. The next day, called him down to his office. 
I sat him down and, and I said, um, there's a lot of colleges out there that will give you a free education uh, if you use football and if you're good enough. And he was like, I care about you and I want to see you succeed. I feel like somebody really cares, especially an officer, you know. Where I'm coming from, you know, officers don't like us. Now I read somewhere that both of you broke down and started crying. Is that true? <laughs> yeah, I didn't want to say that. <laughs> Those words hit home for Shamarco. By his senior year, he was an honor roll student, was elected homecoming king, and set records for tackles, interceptions, and defensive touchdowns. He accepted a scholarship offer to play football for Syracuse University. Sitting there, signing that paper, and veering to 11, seeing my mom cry. You know, a joy. You know, that's the first time I seen her cry a joy instead of pain. And that just changed my whole life. When Shamarco arrived at Syracuse, he quickly built a reputation for his work ethic and hard-hitting style of play. But the spring of 2010 ushered in a season that would crush him harder than any hit he ever delivered on the field. And it began with a call he received from his mother. My mom was like, your dad's dad, she crying on the phone. And I just start crying, I hang up the phone. I'm like, man, like, he's gone now. And I came and say, like, I forgive you, you know? We all make mistakes in life. Shamarco's stepfather was killed in a motorcycle accident. After his funeral, he returned to school. Though he was grieving, the pain he felt over his stepfather would pale in comparison to what was about to come just nine months later. My mom called me. She was just checking on me like some regular stuff. And, uh, I'm trying to go party. <laughs> like, she was like, I just want to tell you I love you and you my chosen one, you know, and if anything happened to me, you know, I know you, I just want you to live out your dreams. And I'm like, I'm just throwing it off like, okay, mom, you know, I got you. The next day, Shamarco received a voicemail from his younger brother. He's like, mama gone. And man, I, I lost it. Shamarco's mother died from a massive heart attack. He returned home as quick as he could to be strong for his five siblings. And he managed to do so until he went to view his mother's body. It was only two seconds, but I couldn't, I couldn't sit in that room. I couldn't stay in that room. I, man, I, that's my best friend. Like, why, why couldn't you? Hmm? Why couldn't you? Because everything I did was for her. And, you know, and just to sit in that casket and not breathe no more. It's like, what I have left, you know? And I couldn't see it like that. I couldn't. I couldn't. Oh, I thought my life was over, you know. What, what was the point of me living? My mom's not here, you know. I want my mom to have a house, big house, car. Like, like this jewelry on this stuff, this don't mean nothing to me. This don't mean nothing to me. I'd rather have my mom here, you know. So, sitting in that casket, the most painful feeling in the world. After the funeral, Shamarco considered giving up school and football to take care of his siblings. But Mrs. Riccio convinced him otherwise. And I always said to him, and I still to this day say to him, is that what your mom would want you to do? And he thinks for a minute and he stops himself and he's like, she would not want me to quit school. And at that moment, when she told me that, it was nothing else to say. It was nothing else to say. I was going to get my butt back on that flight. His grandmother agreed to take care of his siblings so that he could return to school. When he got there, he began looking for something to ease the pain in his heart. So he turned to some of his Christian teammates. One day I just started getting interested in it. I just started watching. I'm like, man, let me go sit here and listen to them and talk, talk about God and stuff. And then I started hearing the solutions and my answers and people as they was talking. That's when I realized I really had to find out who God was, you know? like. Can I believe in you? Because I ain't gonna lie, I started doubting. When my mom passed, I'm like, man, God don't love me at all. He can't love me. He can't love me. You put me through all this. Shamarco learned that the only way to truly heal the pain in his heart was through a relationship with God. So one night, he began praying and committed his life to Jesus Christ. I'm like, God, whatever your plan is and whatever you got planned for me, like, show me and I see, you know? I said, let your will, your will be upon me. Shamarco knew that he could lean on the Lord for strength as he continued to achieve his NFL dreams. And he worked harder than ever. That was my mindset from that point on. Nobody's gonna outwork me. Y'all thought I worked hard then. 
Y'all gonna see now. I promise you, nobody outworked me. Nobody. He had a stellar senior season at Syracuse, becoming one of the top safeties entering the 2013 NFL Draft, where he was selected by the Pittsburgh Steelers. And of course, Ms. Leslie, Coach Scott, and Sergeant Bernstein were there to hear his name called. And we all cried. And it was a truly, truly special day to know that all of his hard work had finally paid off. To say how proud I am, uh, it cannot be put into words, but just uh, tremendously thankful for him uh, being an inspiration to us all. I feel like I was a small part of it because I feel like he's always had it within him to be that. He just needed somebody to show him that he could. Today, Shamarco was with the Denver Broncos. He's married and has kids of his own and his work ethic hasn't changed. As he reflects back over all he had to endure, he knows that his mother would be proud of him and that God's love never fails. I know every step I take, God's taking the steps with me and I am God's soldier. So the faith is everything for me and I can promise you that. Like, that will never change no matter how many days I doubt or how many days I cry or be in pain or what I go through. I know God is standing right beside me. I know every step I take God's taking steps with me, Shamarco Thomas. You see, it doesn't matter what you've been through or how hard the struggle is. God will walk with you. Just trust him. Shamarco lost a lot, but he learned that regardless of all he'd lost, God still had a purpose for his life. In the book of James, chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, it reads, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Verse four, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. In other words, look your struggle right in the face and embrace it. And I know it's hard for some of us, but we've got to do it because in the end, we'll be mature and complete, not lacking anything. We'll be right back. Well, I want to thank you for joining us today, and I hope to see you next week. And remember, it doesn't matter what struggles you face. Just believe in yourself and what God can do through you, because in the end, life is short. Go the distance.